together this this budget coming into office. You were given a um, position at the federal level in finance. So really throwing you in the deep end when coming up with crafting a new budget. Can we begin the conversation tonight by you reflecting a little bit about what you've learned in the process of drawing up this budget? What is it about the intricacies and the complexities of drafting a budget, coming up the budget that you would like us to know? Sure. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I think the first feeling that I had when, when I first joined the, uh, the ministry and then having to immediately launch into the uh, budgeting process is that we have to hit the ground running. Mm. Uh, the, the, the learning curve and the transition is very steep you know, from, from what I did in the past and uh, what I'm doing now. But I want to tell you that it is actually a very pleasant experience, mainly because in the ministry, and this is the feeling that I had uh, in the previous time when I was in government in, in the youth and sports ministry, we always look up to, this, uh, to the officials and the staff from the finance ministry because they are absolutely professionals and, and, and very brilliant in what they are doing. So I think that helped me to transition very smoothly into the, uh, into the task. Um, some of the experience, you know, of course, when we are dealing with budget, we are talking about distribution of resources. There's always trade-off. Mm -hmm. And therein lies some of the challenges, you know, when you give this to this sector, the other sector will get slightly lesser. Or, you know, how, how do you decide on all this? So I think these are some of the uh, emotions and feelings and experience that I have in the past. Ha have, has anyone come back to you and said, why didn't I get more? No, of course. Yeah, there, there, there are some who said, you know, why did you deduct tax, uh, tax rate for the N40 and not for, you know, the other brackets? And why do you not add uh, more tax to, to, to the super rich? You know, there, there are many questions on all this. But I think uh, generally what we are trying to do is to resolve and deal with very urgent and immediate issues the country is facing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that because budget 2023 was about, I think, 15 billion more than the one tabled by Ismail Sabri's government in last October. Help me understand the thinking behind having an expansionary budget. And I'm asking because prior to the budget being tabled, um, the ground was kind of softened for a austerity budget, right? Everyone was kind of prepared for cutbacks. Mm -hmm. Why an expansionary budget? I, I'm not sure if the ground was prepared for a cutback, but um, I think there are four uh, uh, approaches in this budget, or, or probably four themes, four philosophy. Number one is that we can see there is more for the Rakyat. As you said, as you've mentioned, it's an expansionary budget. We have got more development uh, 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 funds. For, for, for example, it's, uh, uh, what, what was it? It's 97 over 71 last year mm. uh, in billion. Uh, but at the same time, we see that despite being expansionary, it is more focused and it is more disciplined. Focus in the sense that you, you don't see the Prime Minister mentioning mega projects this time, you know, bar for one or two, which is already ongoing. But a lot of uh, development funds are going into basic infrastructures, building schools, upgrading hospitals, clinics, internet infrastructure, hawker centres, even a mention of 100,000 per district to, so that the district level uh, agencies can immediately deal with potholes. So it's very focused, very strategic and very disciplined. You can see deficit has reduced from 5.6% to 5% and uh, the government is going to table FRA this year, uh, Fed, uh, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So, All right. so big but focused and disciplined and okay. a lot of immediate fo uh, focus on immediate issues. Can I ask you whether this is the nature of the game now? That every budget we will see will be expansionary, will be bigger than the previous, will be the biggest on record. Is that, is that just the nature of the game, that it will be bigger from now on? I mean, if you look at the budget, Melissa, in, term, in nominal terms, it is the highest. But in terms of the ratio to our GDP, it is actually quite uh, uh, consistent. Uh, we are looking at about 20% mm. ratio to GDP in terms of our uh, the, the budget, the size of the budget. And if you compare that to, let's say, uh, the uh, uh, crisis year, we have reached up to 21% during the Asian financial crisis. We have reached up to even almost 30% during the global financial crisis. So in terms of ratio to GDP, we are still uh, quite consistent with uh, some of the uh, what we call it, the previous years. But I think the, the real question is here is this. It's not about the size of the budget. The, the question is, number one, uh, what are we using the money for? And number two, 
are we able to fund it? So these are more critical questions than merely looking at the size of the budget. Okay, so I'm going to quote some commentators who have responded to the budget, calling it, quote, pragmatic but cautious. It's a pragmatic but cautious budget. Others is, quote, part recovery, part election oriented, but mainly status quo. Mm. C can I ask you whether that's fair? And on that note of, you know, what are you using the money for? What, what do you think people expect from a budget? Mm -hmm. Look, like I said, uh, people expect the budget or, in a way, the government to solve their problem. And what is our current problem? We have to rebuild back, for example, our middle class. We have to rebuild back our SMEs post-crisis, uh, post-crisis years. We have to uh, continue to help uh, the, 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 the vulnerable uh, sector of the society to, to deal with the, uh, the, the rise of cost of living. At the same time, to have a longer term solutions on, for example, food security, how do we bring down the price of food, etc. So I think this is what the people want at this moment, and this is what the budget is offering. <laughs> and mind you, this is a very short and immediate budget because not only we have very little time to prepare, we actually have very little time to execute. Right, is it eight months, you reckon? Yeah, Six yeah, to eight yeah, months? Almost, mm. around that, 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 that window. In fact, Almost immediately after the passing of the budget in this current sitting in March, we are going to kick start the next budgetary cycle. Okay. There's going to be a discussion on the So no, no break budget. for you <laughs> when it comes to budget yeah, crafting. So I may have to come to Astro again. I might have to talk to you about the design of yeah, budget yeah. 2024. Yeah. Um, I, on that note of what people expect from budgets, do you think it's been normalised? to expect goodies in budget. And then the reason I ask is because the, often after a budget is tabled, there's always the headlines of, you know, what do you get in budget 2020? Click here to find out what you get from this budget. Do you think it's become a norm that we have so normalised the expectation of goodies in a budget that when low-hanging fruit, like populist measures like that are not present, the budget is then panned as, you know, t t timid or missing the mark? I think it is inevitable that uh, the different sector will be looking for what's in for them, what's in for me uh, in the government's budget because basically all of us are taxpayers, all of us expect something from the government, from the country. Uh, that in itself is not uh, really a bad thing but I think we also have to learn that in a, in a situation of scarce resources, no matter how rich a country is, mm -hmm. there must be uh, 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 some sort of formula for distribution. So nobody gets everything they want. But what we want to achieve here is an equitable distribution. So, you know, you look at uh, uh, some of the uh, new measures that have been introduced. For example, the, the tax rate cut for, 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 for the so-called middle class. All right. 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 So, some, some, some people are asking, why are you not, uh, why, why are you giving them a tax break? Hmm. But I think it is very important at this moment, especially post-pandemic, the middle class experienced one of the highest drop decline in income in the last two years. 20% of the middle class has gone into uh, the B40 category. So it is important. And middle class is the, uh, one of the drivers and contributors to the economy, one of the key contributors to the economy in terms of consumption, in terms of workforce. So I think it is important that the government deals with this problem to rebuild and strengthen our middle class again. So this is one example. And mm. I can go on and on about SMEs, about, uh, about you know, even the vulnerable groups, about uh, environment, etc. When you say rebuilding the middle class, I mean, I know you've re received some feedback about the, the tax, uh, yeah. particularly if you come out to explain that. Can, can you explain how else this budget helps build the, the middle class? I'm wondering because you're right, the middle class is squeezed when mm. it comes to this cost of living crisis. Mm. And it doesn't feel like there's a, um, there's a lot of support. Would you say that's fair? How, how else would um, so this are, budget rebuild the middle when, class? When I look at comments on the internet, a lot of comments say, you know, this is our time, this is our time, especially from those from the middle income uh, uh, section, because they say every budget we are missed out. You know, every, everything is for the, 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 the businessmen, the big businesses, or, or it's for the SMEs or for the B40s, but nothing for the middle. So this, this is our time, our time has come. But uh, Melissa, it's not just about the tax cut. I think what the government wants to do, and vis-a-vis -vis the, the issues of cost of living, we always say, you know, it is not just about inflation, it is also about the situation with our salary. Mm. We, we are in a middle income trap. 
right? We are a nation in the middle income. So, so what the government is trying to do in this budget, you know, other than putting more money, what I call disposable income via cut, tax cut, we are also, uh, you know, incentivizing employers to hire uh, our graduates, to hire women, to encourage women after post maternity to return back to the marketplace. We are also uh, helping uh, the the rugby to increase their their their, their, their salary, their, their incomes, or, or, or to help them with businesses, uh, small businesses, micro businesses, hawkers. Um, I think one of the very interesting uh, what do you call that uh, 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 initiative in the budget is. Uh, the one proposed by uh, economy minister uh, Saudara Rafizi, you know, how do we, you know, it's not just about handouts, it is also about empowerment. It is about giving them a sustainable uh, avenue to 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 make a living on their own. So I think this is the some of the highlight when it when it comes to middle class, when it comes to B40. It's not just about handouts. It's not just about one off, but it is about improving their life. We are giving uh, subsidies. We are giving incentives and grants to businesses to digitalize so that you reduce dependency on migrant workers, and then you hire or create more high-paying. Uh, technological, technical jobs for locals. This is a long-term plan, right? Budgets are often, you know, short cycles, one year. This is sure, even sure, less than sure, a year. Sure. So, so you have, I mean, like I say, this budget was done in, in two months. Mm. So I, I don't think we pretend that this budget solves every problem. But first, what we're going to do is to put some money, extra money, disposable income into the hands of the people who, who need it the most, and then to rebuild back SMEs. You know, to enable them to bounce back, to enable them to compete again, to enable them to expand even and up the value scale. Short term, long term and uh, medium term. Okay. All right. We're going to take a very quick break, but let's come back and continue this conversation about Budget 2023 with one of the Deputy Finance Ministers, Stephen Sim. We'll be right back after these messages. Stay tuned. Cuaca panas menyebabkan kelemomor minyak dan kegatalan? Tewaskan kelemomor dengan Clear Ice Cool Menthol. Teknologi tiga kali ganda membersih kulit kepala secara mendalam. Tiga kali lebih bersih. Tiada kelemomor, tiada minyak, tiada kegatalan. Clear terbukti menewaskan kelemomor. Jangan lupa Yakut ni. Jom minum Yakut setiap hari. Usus mantap, kuat lagi imuniti. Yakut! Yakut! Cuaca panas menyebabkan kelemomo, minyak dan kegatalan. Clear Men, 100% untuk para lelaki. Teknologi anti kelemomo tiga kali ganda. Tiada kelemomo, minyak atau kegatalan. Dingin pada kulit kepala. Clear Men, terbukti menewaskan kelemomo. Kau adalah yang terukur. Apabila kau hidup untuk detik gemilang ni, kau sedia untuk menggalas segala bebanan dan bertekad untuk menjadi harapan untuk semua. Kepuasan tak terhingga. Hmm. Nikmati kepuasan hari ini. Gardenia puas. What's the latest scoop when it comes to companies, markets and strategies? For everything business and tech related, catch Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani, weekdays 10.30pm across all Awani platforms. Takdir menemukan mereka kembali. Ya, sebuah karya Siti Rosmiza. Saya takut. Takut apa? Takut rindu. Dah terima dah bunga yang dah berada air Terima kasih. Namun ego membutakan hati. Kayaknya aku tak tahu kan kau disekian dengan Zah. Saya was fair, Pa! Kamu mesti nikah dengan Alia. Kau tolong matikan impian kau untuk menumpang kekayaan aku. Biar dia tahu yang kau ni bukan anak patung tau. Jadi manusia bukan bintu ayah. Ayah, aku bintu. Ayah, aku bintu. Apakah tiada bahagia di dalam takdir mereka? Andai itu takdirnya. 
bulai 6 Mac di Astoria dan Astro Go. Hi, welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. I'm speaking tonight to Stephen Sim, one of the finance deputy finance ministers, and we're delving into budget 2023. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about this budget, whether or not it was cautious and crafted with the in mind of the upcoming six state elections. You tell me. <laughs> no, I think uh, when we say we are cautious, it's in the sense that it is much more disciplined, like, like I said. Uh, we are looking at uh, much lower, I mean, slightly lower deficit from uh, 5.6 to 5.0. Uh, and there is a lot, there's a commitment by the government to table the, uh, what do you call that, uh, the Fiscal Responsibility Act as well as the Government Procurement Act. And these two, mm. you know, I, I, would, I would call these two landmark, major landmark fiscal disciplining measures. It is going to, it's going to uh, tie not only the annual administration but future government as well. And this is what I think the country needs it, when it comes to budgeting, when it comes to spending. The people need more transparency, the, they, they need more accountability, they need more, they need lesser populist uh, measures. Okay. I welcome, I welcome to hear that the Procurement Act, the Public Procurement Act is going to be um, to be tabled, maybe, you know, crafted and tabled. So that will be wonderful for public procurement. Um, but when I say cautious, I'm referring to the fact that no extreme measures were taken, nothing too much to rock the boat, no mention of targeted subsidies. That was absent despite all the umbrage that was taken over T20, you know, using s petrol subsidies to the tune of 17 billion ringgit. What are the government's plans for targeted subsidy? Why wasn't in why wasn't it in budget 2023? Well, Lisa, I mean, you, you must be aware that we have already started to implement targeted subsidies for electricity. So at this point, the the, 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 the highest consumption of uh, sorry, sorry what what do you call it? The, the 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 upper tier of the industry they are not getting subsidies because we have removed that subsidy, you know. So we have started on uh, electricity subsidies this this year and uh, it's going to save us at least uh, four to five billion ringgit in terms of uh, electricity subsidy. But in the medium run. In the medium term, we are looking also into uh, targeted subsidies for petrol, for example. And uh, the ministry has been tasked to work out a mechanism. Of, it's it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. You know? Even removing subsidies for um, you know, the, 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 the high-level, high-value, high-revenue high industry has caused some sort of a commotion from them. You see, removing subsidies has never been easy. But I think this is a government committed to doing that. We have gotten into the first step, electricity subsidy tariff. The next step is going to be petrol subsidy on the highest um, upper bracket of the uh, income group. Granted, it's not easy to to wean people off this sugar addiction, this, this addiction to subsidies. But at some point, sure. this government has to be brave enough to do it because it's just... That's the fiscally responsible thing yeah, to do. Yeah. How will you will you have the political will? And I'm going to quote Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Whether the the question is whether there will be political will to affect change. I think the Prime Minister is very clear. He has mentioned about targeted subsidies numerous times. Yeah, and and like I say, we have implemented the first step of it in the electricity sector, in the energy sector. The, 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 the idea is the idea about political view is it's not just on the part of the government. I think the country as a whole need to have the political maturity to deal with this issue. The oppositions need to see this because you know they are government invading after all, and they have they have dealt with. Uh, I, I think now we can safely say that all political parties in parliament at this point has at certain point be part of the government. Mm. So all of us have to sit together and think about the future of the country. Think about the future of, uh, of our nation, think of the future of the people, which is why I think one of the key measures, like I say, is the Fiscal Responsibility Act, because that would impede and that would limit government from going overtly populist when it comes to spending. That would tie up the government's hand, discipline the government when it comes to dealing with uh, uh, costing policy. So I think it is not just about the political view of the government, the 
the Prime Minister is committed, but it is also the political maturity of uh, the leaders in Parliament and as well as the Do you think that there is political maturity? Do you think that something as you know as beneficial as, as a fiscal responsibility act might uh, might get backlash? I mean, is there anyone who might push back against it? I mean, the, it, you know, whenever I say fiscal responsibility act those from our side will say this is tying up our own hands uh. <laughs> so i'm sure the opposition will be more than happy to tie the government's hand okay. but i think this is the most this is the re this is the responsible thing to do right and i'm i, I don't want to be cynical i am optimistic that they are rash they, they are rational uh, leaders on both sides of the divide and leaders who are willing to set aside political differences, leaders who are willing to think, or, or at least we, we, we should spark the debate in, towards this direction. Mm. Speaking about fiscal rules, can I ask you about a feedback that the think tank Ideas has come up? They've noted that um, there's been a high level of political discretion involved in budgeting of development expenditure for states. So they're worried that the federal government's discretion when it comes to state-based state allocation might give rise to, um, you know, consider uh, allocation based on political considerations. So you give to those who are politically aligned to you. That might exacerbate development gaps. H how would you respond to this? Do you believe there should be fiscal rules to govern um, the distribution of allocation to states? I'm a, I'm a strong believer of decentralization. I've been talking about decentralization coming from Penang, for example. And I think the government is committed to that. I mean, look at how uh, the, the central government, the federal government, has uh, 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 has given, for example, more uh, fiscal government governance power to Sabah and Sarawak mm. in terms of approving the, the, the limit that you can approve for development funds uh, for running their own uh, g gas supplies, etc. So I think the the direction of the government is to to empower the state as well. But again. Perhaps all these would, would, would we, we would need uh, you know, better regulations, you know, even an amendment to the uh, constitution. If you want to talk about a formulated, uh, what do you call that, decentralized fiscal uh, policy. Not, so you're not you're not opposed to that. To I am not opposed rules. to okay. empowering the states because we have to empower the state. We are a federation. The, the spirit of the federation is to enable uh, a, a more equitable distribution of wealth not only to the right yet uh, at, at, the, at the micro level, but also to the states. I'm intrigued when you said um, political maturity you know, yeah. and working together, the fact that most of the political parties have in some shape or form been in government and been in opposition. Yeah. What has it been like working in a unity government? Has, has it been challenging working so closely with those who, um, who once had values who that weren't aligned with yours. Has the process been truly collaborative or is it a case of you do your thing, I'll do mine? You know, the, uh, one of the interesting story was, you know, when uh, Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim announced myself and Dr. Sri Ahmad Maslan as both Deputy uh, Finance Minister, uh, somebody dug out my tweet from 2014 saying oh that, you know, it is, you know, I made it my life mission to bring down a government with Ahmad Maslan. And I, I own that trick. I, I own it totally because I said you don't have to look far. You don't have to look to 2014. You know, just weeks before, <laughs> before that announcement, I was campaigning against his party, against his leaders. Mm. I think we have come to a time where, and I think this is a good thing. We have come to a time where the country needs uh, to, to to come together. And I, I'm I'm glad personally that our leaders are willing to set aside you know deeply entrenched differences to come together on uh, on principle on a set of principles we, we are not coming together uh, just so because we can be government there there are a set of principles that we signed as a coalition come together uh, in order to rebuild this country after two or three years of instability of multiple crises my working relationship with for example my colleague uh, dr shama maslan has been very professional you know i was just telling some of your colleagues that you know we are not on a bro basis <laughs> but we coordinate very well uh, we share information and we exchange ideas and when it comes to this budget I think we sat down together exchange what you know our thoughts I, g I gave him my suggestion he gave me his suggestion and then we work together with the uh, with, with the agencies and with the uh, with the budgeting team to, to 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 contribute to the building of the whole budget so I, I would say that uh, you know in times of crisis Malaysians would like to know that leaders their leaders are mature enough to work together
for the sake of the country. Okay, so if you had to assess the past 100 days, so it's coming up to the, the first 100 days of this cabinet. If you had to assess your performance, the, the collaborative nature of this unity government, do you think, how would you assess it? Uh, and I might come back and follow up on whether whether 100 days, what, what can be accomplished feasibly in 100 days? It is a, it's an American construct. Yeah. So, so how would you assess, what have you done in the past 100 days that you think you're proud of? Well, we have tabled the uh, 2023 budget in uh, record time. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I can access, uh, evaluate and assess myself uh, in terms of performance. But I think the government, uh, this is a government that hits the ground running. This is a government on a mission, right? Uh, we, 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 we are... We are a group of different political parties, in fact, f some of us traditional opponents, but we came together on a mission. And that mission is how do we bring together this fragmented Malaysian society when it comes to race and religion? How do we rebuild this country after two, and three, two to three years of uh, multiple crisis? How do we uh, bring Malaysia up again, you know, uh, catch up on Miss opportunities. Stephen, just reflecting back on the time Pakatan Harapan was in government in 2018 and the missteps that happened then, what would you say to those who disagree with you that this is, you know, that you, you're putting together, you bringing together a fragmented uh, country, that they are impatient for the reforms that were promised? 100 days is not long enough? Well, I think the, 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 some of the problems are entrenched. So like I said, this budget deals, for example, this budget deals with immediate issues, deal with immediate needs of the people, the B40. Uh, look at Sumbangan Tunai Rama. You know, it's not just a rebranding, it's not just a renaming. We are looking into, for example, considering the household size of uh, the, the very poor. So we are dealing with uh, short-term problems. Some of these problems can be dealt on an immediate basis. But some problems are entrenched in our society. It's deep and deeply rooted. So I think we need more time. But at the same time, what I think the people can see and what the market can observe is that this is a government on the move. I think you have seen how the minister, uh, how the prime minister at least has uh, shown leadership by example. He has been non-stop uh, today. I think he's in Sabah and he's going to uh, visit one of the ASEAN neighbours. So this is a government uh, which knows that we have to catch up. Okay. On that note, I want to thank you so much for being on the show tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Melissa. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.